Hey everyone, welcome to week 17, day four on this uh, one brush per painting challenge exercise thing. So on Monday, we used uh, this one, this round bristle. Tuesday, long, flat, synthetic. Uh, Wednesday, yesterday, we used Silver Falcon. Silver Falcon brush. No sé por qué dije así, que estúpido. Silver Falcon, our flat, uh, priceless, amazing uh, brush. And today we're going to use a round mongoose. Uh, this is Escoda. Size, it already it doesn't have the size. So I don't know, you know, size, whatever. But I'm only going to use this one for today's painting. That's it. Remember, just one brush. We wipe it clean. I don't use solvent. That's how I keep kind of take care of my brushes. I keep them um, in good shape. And uh, let's see how we do today. Okay, let's get started. For today, we're actually going to use a brush that puts us in a very difficult spot because it is a brush that has been used, or it is a type of brush better, that has been used for you know hundreds of years. But nowadays, we have a better idea of how it has been produced for years and the impact that that has had on specific species. So for today, I thought it was important not to shy away from the fact that because it is very well known that in painting we traditionally use animal products to then talk openly about it. Now I'm gonna use a mongoose brush, a round mongoose brush. And mongoose brushes are becoming quite, quite rare. I even think that the ones that we see on the market nowadays have been on the market for years, but it is very, very hard for a big house, a well-known house of brush makers to be openly producing mongoose hair brushes. The reason is in many, many places in the world, for example, in India, there has been a ban of mongoose products since 1991. And what's terribly sad about this is that regardless of that ban that has, you know, 30 years now, mongoose brushes are still being produced in an illegal manner. Just so people get an idea, just for one kilo of hair, uh, 25 mongoose have to die. And obviously that's not the amount of hair that would be used in a brush, but that gives you an idea of this practice. It is a very primitive practice. It has been done for sometimes tens and other times hundreds of years, depending on the culture. But it's still, nowadays, we have the ability to, to look back and to look at the context in which we make brushes and say, you know, maybe we can do something about this and maybe you can stop this. Now, the, the toughest thing for a painter and a painter like myself is that sometimes we realize that even though we can paint with any brush, and that's been the whole point of this week, regardless of the quality, if we believe we have a way of communicating through paint, then we also have to believe that if we put in our hands a tool that is indeed a lesser tool, that it has a lower quality, that regardless of that nature, we can still paint. And maybe the paintings that we're going to produce, they are not going to challenge paintings that have been created with all these natural hair brushes and have wonderful textures. And for now, we will never be able to reproduce that. But the truth is, we, we kind of have to start making a change. Now, for these last two paintings, I have chosen to work with natural hairs because it's been a practice of mine to still have some of these brushes in my arsenal, in my brush kit. But as time passes by, I've been reluctant to buy any more of these. I will try to be as objective as I can uh, when speaking about these brushes, and I think it's super, super important to speak openly about it. I'll say this right from the start. I don't think I'll buy any more of these brushes uh, from now on because I really feel that while they are a part of our practice, our tradition, and because they are the reason that many of the paintings that we love and respect 
you know, were able to be painted. I think we have a responsibility with nature and acknowledge that while, yes, they are superior products and we should be able to access some things that are quite beautiful in painting with these brushes, we have to acknowledge that our impact may be larger than whatever value we can get from a painting. I am not going to be hypocritical and I'm not going to say I've never used them. No, I've even said that they are absolutely beautiful brushes because the saddest part in all of this is that they are. They are amazing tools. Uh, there, There is a reason why, you know, throughout history, think about it, this has been hundreds of years, even thousands of years, where we as a species realized, oh, wow, this this hair is actually fantastic to use as a tool, as a brush. When it was done tribally or when it was done in a very primitive manner, you could kind of understand it. But now, if it's done in an industrial grade, and maybe not nowadays, but probably, you know, last decade or 20 years ago, um, where the numbers were just insanely high, that's when you start to think we don't we don't need to do this because when we do the impact on those species is so high and the risk of them becoming endangered is so so high that that in the end i really don't think any painting is worth it so what was kind of humbling about this is that i know this is a good brush but i've come to realize that some of these brushes that are beautiful are sort of lost on me i i don't have the technique to use them properly. And the fact that I've decided not to use uh, mediums is something that is actually impacting my painting quite dramatically. So a lot of these brushes, and specifically a lot of these softer brushes, are best put to use if you're using them in conjunction with mediums because they actually aid in the application of paint. And a brush doesn't really have to do much work. It will just get loaded with medium and then it just kind of glides through the surface and while it moves through the surface, it will deposit paint on your substrate. And that's ideally what you have to do. Rougher brushes, brushes with harder bristles, with tougher bristles, they can take a beating and they can kind of understand that their job is just to forcefully put paint on a surface. And if those hairs are degraded, then it's not terrible. Then that's kind of part of the brush's life. But when these softer hairs are not treated properly, and I would argue that I'm not a painter that would treat them properly, then they definitely are not put to good use. So despite me not being able to use them properly, I'm still able to get a ton out of them, and I've been able to do some very, very beautiful paintings with them. And the way I've been able to describe form in some of those paintings, I think comes down to the fact that they are amazing brushes. But I think it is important to understand and to be honest with ourselves and to say, well, I don't really take full advantage of this tool. And more importantly, I think we are at a point where we can say we probably don't need to use any more of these brushes. We probably don't need to produce any more of these brushes. And we should start thinking of how how we can start painting without the aid of any of these brushes. Now, natural hair brushes, we use them a lot in oils. We use them a ton in watercolor and water-based media because they are softer brushes. Among the the more popular ones that we use in oil, the softer hairs, you'll find sable, Kalinsky sable, red sable. Those are very, very common still. Again, the limitations and the laws that are prohibiting the use of sable for brushes is actually growing and growing, which is something quite wonderful. And laws for uh, mongoose brushes, for the ones I'm using today, are really, really quite, quite tough in a ton of countries around the world. So the good thing is, is that these brushes are almost seizing production. And the ones that are that are being produced end up being so expensive that people are going to stop buying them. That's kind of what's happening with lead white too. There are laws that limit the production of lead white paint. And... Again, 20 years ago, even though it was expensive, it was a very expensive pigment, uh, nowadays to produce lead white is actually 
quite, quite expensive. And in the end, the person that's going to buy a tube of lead white is going to end up paying probably twice as much for what we were paying 20 years ago. So that's almost like a natural way for a market to disappear, that things just become so expensive that people just go like, well, it's just not worth the price anymore. And then we stop. And if we stop buying these, that's going to be the only way to stop that market and to stop people from hunting these animals and uh, from skinning them and uh, using their hair for brushes. Now, it puts us in a tough spot because, like I said, a lot of our tradition is based on our tools. And while I would believe that oil paint could be less impacted by the decision to work with uh, synthetic brushes solely, I think uh, watercolor and water-based media would be deeply, deeply impacted and it would suffer tremendously. What does that mean for us? It means that we have to reinvent the way we understand paint. And it would be dumb for us to say, well, we're missing these tools, so now we're never going to be able to access the way in which paint was appropriately handled and the way in which uh, paintings were appropriately constructed. We will never be able to echo uh, paintings of the past where, you know, amazing masters lived and worked with these tools. And if that is the case, then so be it. We just have to be, again, honest with ourselves and say, well, that's a sacrifice that we're all going to be able and willing to do. And it doesn't matter. I think that something we have to understand is that paintings will eventually have to uh, feel and behave like a product of our time. And if in our time we have a belief that we should protect these species and we should be uh, mindful of how impactful we've been on our environment and the life of those species, then it should be an easy answer to say, I am not going to buy any of these anymore. Mm, like I said, that is that is my choice. I really do think that this exercise for me is sort of a way of understanding that, yes, these are my tools. Yes, I've bought, you know, a lot of these natural hair brushes over the years. Um, probably 95% of them have been the uh, hog bristle brushes. And then 5% of them, the more expensive natural hair brushes. But we, we have to understand that there has to be a moment where we take a stance and we say, well, let's just change this. And I think this exercise for me during this week is just a necessary moment of reflection to say it's so hard to let go of your tools and to let go of, of tools that have been close to you, tools that you have already made a connection, have empathy with, and have become almost part of that grammar that in the end is this language that you use to communicate with paint. So it is a great loss, but it is a loss that we obviously can withstand. And it makes no sense for us to say, no, you know, we're going to fight this fight for our natural hairbrushes. I think that that is what's going to happen in the future of painting, which is that a lot of the materials that we now use are still clinging to the past and to our tradition. But we have to realize that a lot of those things are toxic for us. A lot of those things are toxic in the sense that they are bad for the environment when they are being produced. So I thought this was important because, yes, this is an exercise that has to do with our tools and how we understand our tools and how to make the most out of them. But we also have to know, and deep down in our heart, we have to be aware of how these tools are made. And we have to accept that if we're using them, we're also part of this bigger market that is having this impact. So I would just tell people, do a lot of soul searching. You can't do anything about the ones that you've bought. I'll say it with 100% honesty. When I got a bunch of these brushes years ago, I was very ignorant about the manner in which they were produced. Now I know better, and that's probably why I'm far more comfortable with just getting cheaper synthetic brushes. Now, whew, if we really look deep into the production of, of the materials of art, it's going to be tough. It's going to be very, very tough because, like I said, a lot of the things that we use 
are kind of grounded on tradition that spans sometimes thousands of years and many times just hundreds of years. So it's very hard to change that very solid foundation, but we have to try it. If it is slowly for, you know, a lot of us, that's fine. If you just want to stop and try to find alternatives into which brushes you um, you want to get, that's perfectly fine. I thought it was quite humbling, now, and now speaking about the painting, that this painting actually gave me a really hard time. This brush was actually very, very tough to use for this painting. It was a little too soft, a little too uneven. Um, it does have a, a shape, but it's not maintained through the brush stroke. So it is a very, very beautiful brush in the sense of how it lays down paint, but it has an irregular nature uh, when it does the brush stroke. So I think that that was very tough with this almost abstract painting I wanted to do of this uh, trail of light that was hitting Tyson. I probably could have spoken way more about the uh, the painting and how light is actually aiding me in this composition and how the traveling of light is the one thing that is justifying the elongated composition because remember we were echoing aspect ratios from last week so this is actually the far more rectangular one this is actually the 2.76 to 1 ratio so yes that trail of light is what the horse carriage the stagecoach was to the uh, quentin tarantino little study that we did last week so today we needed that light that beam of light that kind of lands tyson's head and his cone this this is an image that dates back to the time when he was neutered and he had to have like this uh, cone of shame but he's fine now tyson is totally fine but i wanted to concentrate on the nature of the brush that i'm using right now and to say that i am fully aware of of where this brush comes from and that I think we have to take responsibility for, for that and we have to take a stance. Mine is that I don't buy any of these brushes anymore. It is a wonderful tool and in the hands of masters 400 years ago, 500 years ago, 300 years ago, it made incredible paintings, but I don't really need it anymore. So that's what I eventually did with lead white too. And I think in terms of paint, cadmiums are going to go the same way and we're going to have to be able to say goodbye. It's going to pain me. I, I, I'm the first one to tell you this is going to be tough for me. But, you know, we also have to believe that we are an incredibly inventive species and the tools that we're going to make are going to be amazing. And, you know, we're going to be able to make centuries of amazing painting with those tools and, and feel proud that we didn't have an impact on the environment and that we were not using things that were hazardous for ourselves and our families. Tough conversation. It is certainly something to really reflect upon, but it's a conversation that I think we all should have and we all should be conscious of. We can't be hypocritical about it. We have to come right out and say, yes, I've used these products, but really think about their future use. So that was the painting for today. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And um, tomorrow we're using, like I said, another natural hair brush. Tomorrow we're going to use a sable brush, uh, but we're going to be aided by a palette knife. And hopefully what you'll be able to see is that our palette knife becomes a better tool uh, than the brush. Not for putting paint, but just for uh, <laughs> scraping paint and giving us like really nice alternatives. So sometimes... A brush can be a very, very beautiful tool, but when, uh, when accompanied by something that actually takes paint away, then that balance is actually the one that we're looking for. So I'll see you guys tomorrow. Thank you for hanging out. Bye.